Good morning and welcome. I'm here at the Stephen Udva Hazy Centre in Virginia. I'm here with Nick Partridge. He's one of the public relations specialists at the centre. Nick has kindly offered to give us a small tour of the space artifacts. We're going to start off with a shuttle, so I'm just going to introduce you to Nick. Nick, welcome. Thank you. And thank you very much for giving your time today. Certainly. Nick, I'm just going to hand over to you. We're standing in front of Discovery. Uh, if you can just get, tell us what you know about Discovery and how it got here as well, and we'll take it from there. Absolutely. Uh, Discovery does dominate the center of the space hangar. It is the champion of the shuttle fleet. It flew 39 times over its career and traveled 240 million miles, totaling 365 days in space. Uh, one of the interesting things about Discovery that makes it so notable for us is that it flew every mission profile that the shuttle was designed to do, making it an excellent uh, example of the historic shuttle program. It launched Hubble, it uh, did the return to flight flights uh, at times, and it arrived here in April of 2012 after its final flight in 2011 on STS-133. It replaced the Orbiter Enterprise, which we had on display here for a number of years. That went to the Intrepid Museum in New York. Okay, what we'll do, we'll just follow uh, uh, Nick and we'll just take a look around Discovery as well. So Nick, what did, what did it actually arrive here at the center? Arrived in 2012, it is exactly as it arrived. Uh, some people do ask whether we did any restoration work on it. We did not. Uh, we felt it was important that it appear exactly as it had flown in space mm -hmm. with all of the scorch marks from re-entry, all of the dust that it received in re-entry. Um, it looks quite different from Enterprise in that respect, which was bright and white. Uh, Enterprise never flew in orbit. Discovery flew 39 times and you can really see it on the uh, on the outside of the shuttle, on the yes, tiles. Yes, you can and on see the, the wear and tear. Yeah, yeah, and on the beta cloth blankets at the top. The Canada arm right here has been removed from the cargo bay and put on display. There is still a part of the Canada arm apparatus installed in the cargo bay, but the operational part that would have been used to handle satellites in the orbit is here. And of course, it's one of three remaining shuttles, one in Kennedy Space Center, which is Atlantis, and the other Endeavour, which is at the in California. Yes, okay. yeah. those are the three flown orbiters. Uh, Enterprise, Enterprise, of course, was a test article for mm -hmm. the landing tests and is in New York. And that is a beautiful view of the, the main engines. Yes, the main engines are... Uh, mock-ups to a degree. The uh, main engines themselves were retained by NASA for use in future programs. We do have one main engine on display at our other location in Washington, D.C. that is a complete engine made from parts from several flown engines. Mm -hmm. Because I think, uh, did NASA reuse some of the shuttle stuff as well? Yes. Yeah, a lot of the technology will be reused in future programs. And the ports here for the main tank are open and you can see from the railing. This is where the hydrogen and oxygen would have fed into the orbiter to feed the shuttle main tanks. I'm sorry, the shuttle main engines. And here's a question which it, you may not know the answer. How many tiles on the bottom of this, the, this shuttle? Many. <laughs> yes, I many, don't know many either, tiles. <laughs> I thought I'd just throw that one in there. There is an answer. There is indeed, but but it is an incredible piece of engineering, it really is. I do know that no matter the number of tiles, and there are many, each one goes in exactly one place. Yes. Now, of course, it's not just the Shetland Discovery that is here uh, at the centre. There's a number of other space artifacts, and um, we're just going to ask Nick to give us an overview of, of some of the other uh, items that are here. OK, 
Okay, now we're just going to have a look at some of the actual uh, capsules that were used uh, during the Mercury and Gemini programs. Nick, this is Freedom 7 2. Yes. Uh, we obviously know about Freedom 7. Why was it Freedom 7 2? Freedom 7 2 was the spacecraft that Al Shepard, the first American in space, hoped to fly for his second Mercury flight. Uh, it was to be a long duration Mercury flight, an endurance test to prove the ability to stay in space for long periods of time. But the previous Mercury flights had been so successful up to that time that NASA decided to proceed directly to preparations for the Gemini program, and this spacecraft did not fly. So there wasn't, there's nothing wrong with the capsule or the, the program. It's at that point, it just achieved everything they wanted to achieve, and they had to move on. If anything, it had worked too well. Yeah. Uh, this is one of only two Mercury spacecraft that display the full orbital configuration, including the retro rocket pack still attached. Yeah, because normally they're obviously jettisons in the space. Yes. And Big Joe? Big Joe is an unmanned vehicle that NASA flew in 1959. It was a suborbital flight that lasted 13 minutes. It was the second launch of the Mercury program and the first one to use an Atlas booster. It uh, helped NASA evaluate the booster, the heat shield, and the flight dynamics. It was packed full of instruments and was, at the time, the largest spacecraft that the United States had flown, hence the name Big Joe. Mm. And now we're moving on to Gemini. Gemini, obviously, moving from Mercury's one-person capsule was for uh, two astronauts. Yes. Who, who would have been in this capsule? This is Gemini 7 and was flown by Frank Borman and Jim Lovell. It was the, at the time, ultimate endurance flight. It flew for 14 days to demonstrate the ability to uh, orbit and stay in space and operate for the length of time that it would take a spacecraft to get to the moon and back. Uh, it was an endurance record that stood until 1970. It also performed along with Gemini 6A, the first space rendezvous. And of course, if you, if you look inside, I just thought of spending two weeks inside uh, a space that size. It's just an incredible. And now we're moving on to a slightly different looking capsule. What's this, Nick? This is an experimental capsule. This is the Gemini Paraglider capsule. Early in the Gemini program, they considered various landing methods, including uh, LAN landings. This paraglider capsule attached to the Gemini paraglider wing above us would have been able to land on traditional runways. Uh, it was a very interesting test. It was not favored above traditional water landings. Water landings were a uh, tried and proven technology and method that they eventually went with for the actual missions. It just shows at that time they were looking at every aspect uh, of, of the mission, not just the launch, but also how to bring their astronauts back as safely as possible as well. Mm -hmm. And this is probably the more traditional means of uh, returning the, the astronauts back. Yeah, speaking of water landings, this is a boilerplate Apollo Command module but the flotation collar and flotation bags on top that you see are the genuine articles from Apollo 11. All right. These were the bags that would deploy in the ocean when Apollo 11 returned back from the moon. This is the spacesuit worn by Jim Irwin, the lunar module pilot on Apollo 15. So this has actually been to the moon? Yes, it has. And we have his helmet and gloves and visor. And here is the inner pressure helmet and the EVA visor along with the gauntlets. And of course there is a number of other uh, very historic items. You have Columbia, which is the Apollo 11 uh, command capsule, but that's not on display at the moment. Where is that at the moment? It is in the Mary Baker Ingham Restoration Hangar. Uh, it can be viewed by the public from the overlook. It is undergoing conservation treatment ahead of a tour that it will be embarking on later this year to four cities in the United States, leading up to the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. And would you know what cities it's going to? St. Louis, Pittsburgh, 
Houston and Seattle. And again, they're just putting Nick on the spot there, so well done. <laughs> And just a, a number These of other items. are helmets, gloves, and other items from flights and from training from the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo era. Okay, we're just going to look at some of the other space artifacts that are in the museum, and we're looking at a, a rather it's a slightly strange looking probe. Nick, what are we looking at here? This is the engineering model for the Vega Solar System probe, bus, and landing apparatus. And where was this sent to? Was this, uh, well, obviously, this is just a, a model, but the actual probe itself uh, went to Phoenix? Yes. Uh, in 1984, the Soviet Union launched the Vega 1 and Vega 2 spacecraft which flew by Venus and dispatched atmospheric instruments and landers, then went on to pass through the tail of Halley's Comet. And as you know, Venus is probably one of the most inhospitable planets that we have in the solar system. If my memory's right, uh, I think one of the landers actually managed to send back one or two pictures and lasted a matter of minutes, but even to actually land and operate on Venus in itself was an, an, an achievement that's certainly never been equaled. There's a few other artifacts. What we, this is the Pathfinder? Yes. This is the Mars Pathfinder Lander and Sojourner Rover. Pathfinder was the, space first craft, the first spacecraft to land on the Red Planet since the two Viking landers in 1976. It was launched in December of 1996 and reached Mars on July 4th, 1997. And of course, this started off a, a whole trail of... of uh, robots that have gone to the planet since obviously a place of curiosity and opportunity this really was a, was a pathfinder in itself yes yeah the uh, spacecraft landed using uh, inflating airbags there's a parachute then rockets to slow down then bounced in these airbags that have been specially designed then the probe itself unfolded releasing the sojourner rover that you see sojourner was the backup the actual articles are of course on mars oh, yeah Okay, what we're looking at now is what's known, what's known as Space Lab. Obviously, today we have the International Space Station, but back in, in the days of the shuttle, Space Lab was a, a mission that was sent up. Nick, what, would, what do we know about Space Lab? Space Lab was developed by the European Space Agency and allowed the Space Shuttle to function as an intermittent space station ahead of the construction of the ISS. It would fit inside the cargo bay of the Space Shuttle Orbiter. The entire cylinder would go inside and connect to the orbiter airlock via a special tunnel and allow to drastically increase the pressurized area of the Space Shuttle. So that was, an, that was just a created by ESA, the European Space Center, uh, Agency. Mm -hmm. So it was the first start, well, a very important part of countries working together that eventually out of that came the International Space Station itself. Absolutely. Uh, it would have been outfitted with racks containing subsystems, computers, workstations, stowage lockers, supplies, equipment, and experiments that varied from mission to mission. There were two space labs constructed that flew on a total of 16 missions from the early 1980s through the late 1990s. This one was the first module and it was used nine times. This is the mobile quarantine facility. It is one of four converted Airstream trailers that NASA designed to quarantine astronauts returning from the moon on the unlikely contingency that there were lunar contagions. They wanted to isolate the astronauts from contact with other people until they were certain that they were not bringing back anything from the moon that would be contagious. Uh, it has a sleeping quarters inside, it has a kitchen and a bathroom. This would have been the home of the astronauts on the deck of the USS Hornet, which was the recovery aircraft carrier, en route back to Houston. And how long did they actually have to spend in this facility? They were in this trailer for 65 hours while it was flown from the Hornet to Johnson Space Center. Okay, another piece of history 
the Tattoo Museum. And this is the actual helmet and gloves that were worn by uh, Neil Armstrong. Nick, there is a, yeah, uh, a bit of a story as to why they're here and how you came to preserve them. Uh, yes. Can you tell me a little bit about, about that? Yeah, these are on temporary display here at the Udvar Hazi Center. The extravehicular gloves and EVA visor. The suit itself is undergoing extensive conservation work uh, following a successful Kickstarter campaign to provide funding to stabilize the suit ahead of its return to permanent display in our downtown Washington, D.C. location for the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 in 2019. And you say it was done by Kickstarter. Can you remember just how much was raised through that? We raised $500,000 to conserve the suit, and we achieved our stretch goal, which was a little bit of additional funding to conserve Al Shepard's... Uh... I'm, certainly, I, I'm certainly hit by the amount of history that's just immediately here. Nick, uh, if I could just uh, pass over to you, if you could just take us around some of the exhibits here and point out a few things. Sure, absolutely. This is the Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall. It's our central gallery. It was renovated just last summer. Since 1976, more than 300 million people have come through here, and it contains some of the most significant artifacts in the history of flight, including space flight. The most visually striking centerpiece there is Lunar Module 2. That is an actual lunar module. It was intended for a test flight during the Apollo program, but an earlier test flight was so successful that that was deemed unnecessary, which is lucky for us, because now it is here in our central gallery, outfitted to look as closely like Eagle from Apollo 11 as possible. Can it just be fairly, fairly identical to the actual landers that actually went to the moon? This one is slightly heavier than the landers that went to the moon. This would have been more akin to the landers that did the Earth orbit tests, but it is visually outfitted to look like Apollo 11's eagle. Now, there's quite a lot of people here, but I want to know if we could just take a sort of, maybe get a closer look at it as well. Absolutely. Of course, there's a little figure there to give you a sense of perspective on just how large the lander actually is. And how long have, you, have the, has the lander actually been here in the center, in the museum? Since 1976, it was in the east end of the building until just last year when we moved it here into the Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall. It was previously in the Arts and Industries building which is one of the original Smithsonian museums a little further down the National Mall here in Washington. And of course, just above it actually is another historic craft. We have the Spirit of St. Louis sitting up there as well. Uh, and that's what I was just saying. When you come in here, you are hit by quite a number of his historic objects and uh, exhibits. And to our right, there's actually uh, a few more from the, uh, is that Gemini and Mercury? Yes, it is. This is Gemini 4, the, uh, the horizontal spacecraft, and the vertical spacecraft next to it is Friendship 7. Gemini 4, of course, is the first mission uh, featuring an American spacewalk. Ed White spacewalked during Gemini 4, and right next to it is Friendship 7, which is John Glenn's spacecraft that he used to become the first American to orbit the Earth. Um, of course, these are the original uh, craft themselves, they're not replicas. They are absolutely the originals. They have been also here since 1976 when uh, they were transferred to the Smithsonian from NASA a few years ago. Well, I'm not sure if we can see right down at the end, we have one of the Mars landers. We don't want to get a bit of the work. So, wait, get rid of this. Nine point one million visitors between both locations. It can get crowded yes, in here. Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. This is our Viking lander. This was the backup craft for our Viking lander. Uh, Viking landed on Mars on July twentieth, nineteen seventy six, just seven years to the day after the Apollo eleven landing. 
And of course, this wasn't just a model or a, a mock up, this is actually used by the scientists back here in Earth. They were replicating some of the uh, experiments that were going on on Mars and see how the, the, the spacecraft would operate. Yes, uh, absolutely. This one is identical to the two landers that uh, landed on Mars in 1976. It certainly could have flown if need be. Uh, during mission planning and while the landers operated on Mars, scientists and engineers used this duplicate to model how the landers would respond to various radio commands. And just above us, there's a, a, maybe a more modern piece of space aircraft. If we can, there we go. What are we looking at? Oh. That is Spaceship One, the uh, first successful commercial uh, private spacecraft. Uh, it flew two successful suborbital missions in order to win the uh, Ansari X Prize a few years ago, which was an interesting callback to the spirit of St. Louis, which was flown across the Atlantic to win a similar prize, the Ortiz Prize. Okay. And of course, that's Virgin and to Richard Branson, and that's still going ahead. Uh, they, they, I think they just done a recent test uh, in the last few months, and space tourism uh, is very much a goal for uh, Virgin Galactic, I think, in the actual organization's called. And across from that, on the other side of the room, there is an accident team. It's not just any accident team. Who actually flew that one? Nick? That is the X-15 that Neil Armstrong flew during the program. Uh, of course, the X-15 was uh, the fastest aircraft in the world in some auspices. Well, it's the fastest aircraft in the world outright. Uh, the Blackbird only gets the uh, nod if you include air-breathing jets. Yeah. Okay. And say, this is just the entrance hall. And there's one other thing, actually. If we can just scroll around on the wall, there's a large uh, fan. Where's that? That enormous fan that some people from the ground mistake for a spruce goose propeller is actually the full-scale wind tunnel fan from NASA Langley. That was the wind tunnel that NASA used to test all of the spacecraft, uh, test the design of the spacecraft for re-entry and how the dynamics would work at speed. This is actually the dynamic structural test vehicle. Uh, it was used for uh, stress tests, temperature, heat, and cold, uh, vibration tests to subject the, uh, subject the frame to what kinds of stresses it would be subject to during launch and deployment. Uh, then it was used to lay out all of the wiring harnesses and design all of the systems and kind of fit them in place before they built the actual Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, this was in use from the late 1970s through the 80s as they de designed and developed the telescope. And that just shows you how long there actually Hubble was in development for decades because it was obviously in the late 90s before it actually got up into space. Mm. So this, I mean, it is such a massive uh, exhibit. It's hard, you know, when you see pictures of Hubble, you don't really realize just how <laughs> giant a telescope it really is. Yeah, it's hard to get in frame. Yeah, yeah it really is. So I'm struggling here at the moment. Okay, so we've got Hubble there and we're moving probably a bit back again to the 70s and during the Cold War there wasn't much cooperation between the Russians and the Americans but here we have one example of it. Yes. We have um, uh, Apollo Soyuz. Yeah this is the Apollo Soyuz test project mock-up. In July of 1975 the Soviet Union and the United States flew a joint space mission uh, which looked something like this once they met up in orbit. These are uh, test articles, both vehicles are test articles. The docking module in the center is actually the flight backup. So that is the real deal that would have gone up had the first one had any malfunction. And again, that was one of the few times both nations were able to work together, probably until the ISS came along. Okay, and just have a look here. If we swing back around to our left, there is a, a giant tank, almost sitting there. Uh, that Nick is Skylab, or a replica, replica Skylab. That is actually the backup Skylab. Mm -hmm. So that is to the extent that a real space station can still be a real space station, not having flown in space. That is Skylab. It would have gone up much like the docking uh, module 
had there been a malfunction with the first one. This one has, of course, been modified to sit on the stand here in the gallery and has had uh, hatchways cut into it so that our visitors can pass through and see the inner workings of the space station. Skylab was America's first space station. And uh, in another part of the museum is actually the command module that took the astronauts saw them up and brought them back down. Hopefully we'll get a chance to look at it again. And you were saying uh, a little bit of information, Nick. You were saying that this is actually part of an what would have been a Saturn V? Yes, uh, the fascinating thing that I love about Skylab, without getting into too broad of a generalization, is that it was built inside of a uh, the gas tank to a moonship. Uh, the Saturn V uh, stage that would have done the last push to get astronauts and spacecraft to the moon when you are not going to the moon is not as necessary, so they built the space station inside that stage of the Saturn V rocket and used the rest of the Saturn V to push the space station into Earth orbit where it was visited by crews of three members each. I think we just one item I want to do want to look at and it shows you just some of the battering that Hubble has gone through during its time in space. This is a this is from the camera that was removed from Hubble, is that right Nick? Yes, during one of the servicing missions, uh, this camera was removed from Hubble and replaced with an upgraded, more sophisticated unit. And uh, one of the interesting things is you look at it and it looks maybe like all of these holes are where it was struck in space. And that is true, but the important thing to note is that those holes were not punched as we see them now by debris in space. NASA, before turning the camera over to us, drilled out each place on the camera that had been struck by debris so that they could study it in depth, find out uh, the shape, the forces, uh, how deep it had penetrated. So yes, those are all the places it was struck. No, all of those holes were not punched in space. Yes. But it does give a clear indication of just the punishment that uh, Hubble and I suppose any other satellite can go through because of the amount of debris that's floating about. It is certainly a dramatic visualization. Okay, we're in another part of the museum which is looking at exploring the, our own galaxy, our own solar system and uh, our planets. We're looking at a spacecraft which is called Stardust. Nick, w w what was Stardust about? Stardust was the first U.S. space mission dedicated solely to returning extraterrestrial material from beyond the moon. Uh, it collected samples from a comet called Viald 2 and uh, interstellar dust along the way. It launched in 1999 and spent seven years in deep space before this particular portion of the spacecraft, the return module, landed in the Utah desert in 2006. Okay, and of course, there's very few uh, spacecraft that have actually gone beyond the moon, collected material and actually returned it again to the Earth. So this is probably one of, I was going to say a handful, not even a handful of spacecraft. It's certainly the only one I can think of. I'm sure there's probably one or two others. Okay, we're just going to look at uh, two replicas of spacecraft, one from our past, and one very much from our present. What we're looking at at the moment is uh, New Horizons. Now, obviously, New Horizons, uh, just a few years ago, went to Pluto and gave us those fantastic pictures and all the data that came with it. Nick, do you have any more information about uh, New Horizons and its current mission? Yeah, it, uh, of course, was the first spacecraft to explore Pluto, and it launched in 2006. It took several years to get there. It was a three billion mile journey uh, and did return, as you said, those amazing photos of Pluto. It is now on a continuing mission to the Kuiper Belt. It uh, detected an object that was deemed worthy of study and the uh, New Horizon mission was extended to include that. It is on its way there and will reach it uh, many months from now. Yeah, so we're looking forward to seeing what New Horizons still has in store for us. Now to the left of New Horizons, and I don't think we're going to fit it all in, is just space history. Anybody who knows anything about uh, spacecraft knows, knows what this is. This is Voyager. And of course Voyager launched in the 70s and sent back some of the most amazing pictures we've actually seen of our, our uh, solar system certainly at that time. Nick, uh, if you could tell us a bit more about this. This is the full-scale mock-up of Voyager. Uh, it was used for engineering tests ahead of the launch of the actual vehicles. It is full-scale and the scale of it always surprises uh, that 
These spacecraft, the two spacecraft, are still out there operating to some degree, uh, including Voyager 1, which is now 17 billion, more than 17 billion miles away, and left the solar system uh, just a couple of years ago. Yeah, I was, I was going to see if I can just fit everything in, just to give you an idea of just how the size of the whole uh, spacecraft. So where is the land? If we just pan across here. Uh, the reason uh, it is, that particular arm is so long is because at the far end you have basically a nuclear reactor. So all the instruments, which are particularly sensitive, have been put as far away from that as possible. But to say, until you actually see the size of these, uh, you don't appreciate just how incredible they really are. Okay, we've left the spaceships and space rockets to one side for a moment, and we've come into another part of the museum. Uh, this is quite a, a historic part, uh, probably the birthplace of uh, flight. Nick, uh, where are we at the moment? We are in the Wright Brothers Gallery, and this is the 1903 Wright Flyer. This is the world's first successful powered, heavier-than-air aircraft. Okay, and uh, how much of this is the original aircraft itself? More than 80%. Uh, it was disassembled following the crash the day of the first flight in December of 1903 and uh, various parts including the cloth covering and the propellers were uh, refitted with exact accurate replicas of what did fly on that day in 1903 and of course we've got the original skin covering and propeller here in the gallery alongside of it along one wall. Mm -hmm. And of course, although it's not direct, you know, directly related to space flight, without the, this flight and others like it, we wouldn't be uh, going to the moon in just over 100 years since this.